Good evening, everyone. Sorry for that slight delay. Uh, welcome to Genome Lates, a regular series of evening events from the amazing public engagement team within Welcome Connecting Science. I'm Julian Rayner. I'm a genomics researcher, and I'm also have the privilege of being director of Welcome Connecting Science. We're based on the Welcome Genome Campus just outside Cambridge, and we work in very close partnership with the amazing research institutes there, the Welcome Sanger Institute, and the EMBL European Bioinformatics Institute. Those institutes are at the leading edge of genomics, and it's our mission to take that work out to the wider world, enabling everyone to explore genomics and its impact on research, health, and society. The campus where we work has its origins in the Human Genome Project, which this year is celebrating its 30th anniversary. As a researcher who lived through that time, it's still almost impossible for me to imagine a world, especially a human disease research world, without the Human Genome Project. And we're very privileged tonight to be joined by several people who were involved in that genome project um, and can share their experiences of being part of that unique moment in time. We're also joined tonight by more than 130 uh, participants online. And so please uh, ask questions uh, as we go along in the Q&A box. Um, and we'll make sure that the panel gets through as many of the questions as we can. So the panel tonight, uh, we're joined by Dr. Simon Gregory. Um, Simon is at um, Duke University in North Carolina, where he's a professor and also the director of genomics and epigenetics. His research involves the identification of the molecular factors influencing the development of neurological disease, including multiple sclerosis and autism. And he's now developing and applying single cell genomics techniques towards understanding the mechanisms of disease development, including cancer. We're also joined by Dr. Kirsten Howe. Kirsten started working at the Sanger Institute in 2000 after gaining her PhD in genetics in Germany. And she initially worked on the gene annotation team for the Human Genome Project, and then took an interest in improving reference genome assemblies, working in, on a number of important model organisms, including zebrafish and the nematode worms. In 2008, she was one of the founding members of the Genome Reference Consortium, which has the ongoing improvement of the Human Reference Assembly as its prime purpose. One thing I've learned from being on the Genome Campus, a genome is never finished, despite what the headlines say. And it's the work of people like Kirsten and her team that lead to the validation of genome assemblies. And they're now involved in validating a huge number of different genomes, including the very exciting Darwin Tree of Life project, which aims to sequence all the genomes of all the complex organisms on Earth. We're also joined by Dr. Jane Loveland. Jane has a background in virus research, plant biochemistry, and molecular biology, and uh, did her PhD on um, photosynthetic enzymes. She moved into bioinformatics, the analysis of biological data in 2000, working as a computational molecular biology specialist, and joined the Sanger Institute in 2002 as part of the human vertebrate analysis and annotation team, working on manual gene annotation and curation of the human, mouse, zebrafish, and other vertebrate genomes. In 2017, she moved from Sanger to the EMBL EBI, where she's still involved in genome annotation, um, including in a number of major international collaborations. And finally, the chair for tonight's session is Dr. Chris Gunter. Chris earned her PhD in human genetics at Emory University and then worked on the X chromosome inactivation at Case Western uh, for her postdoc. Um, the, she then went on to an editorial fellowship at the journal Human Molecular Genetics. And for six years, she served as a senior editor at the very prestigious journal Nature. Then she went on to help establish the preprint server BioArchive, where, um, where journal articles are released very early so that they can be read by the um, largest number of people as rapidly as possible. After creating the position as the Director of Research Affairs at the Hudson Alpha Institute for Biotechnology, she moved to Emory School of Medicine, serving as a lead for research grants from the NIH and Simons Foundation on Autism. Since 2019, she's been Senior Advisor for Genomics Engagement at the National Human Genome Research Institute at the NIH in the USA, and is the Head of Engagement Methods in the Social Behavioral Research Branch. That's more than enough for me. It's now my great pleasure to hand over Chris to Chris and uh, start the panel discussion. 
thank you so much, Julian. All the panelists are so impressive that it's it's great to hear what everybody has done. So I want to start off tonight. We this is the, I think the fourth in this series of genome leads, and so we've talked about a number of genomic things. But what I'd like to do is start us off tonight, uh, particularly for people who are just joining us or ha haven't had the many years in genomics that we have. The first question I, I want to ask is to define a couple of terms so that we are all using the same terms throughout the evening and we're all mean them the same way. So the first question that I want to ask the panel is what is the difference between mapping and sequencing? When you use those two terms, what do you mean? So um, if, if the others don't mind if I go first. Um, so I always think of mapping as um, if you took a, a sort of a body of knowledge and then broke it into sort of um, uh, encyclopedia sized pieces. So if you think of the human genome as uh, 24 volumes. So for the younger uh, students who are listening to us, uh, an encyclopedia is something your parents probably bought from someone selling it door to door. Uh, so if you took Wikipedia and compressed it into 24 volumes, um, mapping is the thing that uh, a volume represents a chromosome and uh, mapping is effectively uh, generating an order of, um, I suppose, biological meaningfulness from the, the first cover to the last cover. And in there, in each chromosome, each volume, you have an order of things that uh, exist within a volume. And to me, the sequence of the letters, uh, and, but the mapping is the thing that sort of places things in a particular order within a volume. Um, and so that's sort of what, how I sort of perceive it. Great. And I really love how you and Jane have placed yourselves in front of maps. That's our visual yeah, aid. Yeah. Very nice, very nice. We coordinated earlier, it was great. <laughs> that's awesome. Okay, so that's mapping and then sequencing, which we're gonna talk more about. But once we've started sequencing, what's the difference then between assembling a genome and annotating a genome? What do we mean when we use those two terms? Let me start off with the assembling. So um, in the case of the human genome, uh, the mapping was done first. So basically we knew roughly where all the individual words went into all these books, but we didn't know the whole word. We maybe had a letter of each. Mm -hmm. so the sequencing then uh, found out what the missing letters were. And because we had the mapping, we knew how to place them all. Um, so the sequencing basically allows you to get the full information that is stored in each of these books and the mapping told you in which order they went. And once you had all the content and the order of all that content, you could put all those books together. Uh, and uh, well, the only thing that was missing then was basically making sense of all the text in there. And that's what annotation is. So maybe I hand that over to Jane. Yeah, so I work in gene annotation and the annotation as Kirsten says is making sense of the rest. So to use the same analogy, it's actually creating the narrative and the paragraphs within your book so that it actually puts it together and it makes sense. Because the human genome has around sort of 3 billion letters and it's all very well putting that in books in the right order. But until you actually make sense of the bits that actually mean something, that's what we want to do. So you want to make sure that it means something and you can actually view these things and look at it and it makes a bit of sense. So that's what annotation is. Excellent. Wow. It's almost like y'all have done this before or something. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let me, and then we're going to, I'm going to have ask each of you to talk a little about your path, but finally, I know we're going to talk about genome browsers. So what would, when you say genome browsers, what do you mean? Well, I, I work for Ensemble, which is one of the main genome browsers. So maybe I should take this to start with. Awesome. So a genome browser is a graphical interface to display a genome. So it takes all of these volumes of data. It takes all the annotation and it displays it in a graphical way. So otherwise you'd have a very flat page with all these letters and little things shaded, trying to sort of move it together. So we have a nice graphical interface, which is arranged by chromosome when you can zoom in and you can zoom out. And we can add, what I work on is genes. So these are primarily things that actually code for proteins. And these will be sections of DNA which are linked together to form a gene unit. 
And then also we can add extra information as well. So it adds extra value. So as well as having genes, we will have other things like uh, regulation, which is to do with how a gene is expressed. So how much of a gene you get or how little of a gene you get. Things like variation, where you get differences between people, seeing what's the same and what's different compared to the reference, which is the sequence that we're talking about. And things like comparative genomics as well, which are incredibly important. So we don't just look at one human. We look at our reference, we look at other people, and we also look at other organisms as well. Great, excellent, thank you all. So uh, for everyone watching, we would love to take your questions. You can put those in the Q&A box um, and we'd like to prioritize questions from students. So please feel free to indicate to us that you're a student when you're asking questions. So I think we talked about this in advance and what we're gonna do is start with what it seems now like ancient history, but it didn't seem like that then. <laughs> and I'm gonna ask Simon to start off with uh, how he joined the Sanger Then Center and uh, started on genomics. Sure. So um, I joined the Sanger in 1993, so what, 17 years ago. Um, and there were, I think, 53 people working on the campus at the time. Um, now there's over two and a half thousand on the, the whole genome campus, so it's um, enlarged enormously. So when I first went there, um, we were working out of an old 60s or 70s building. Um, I did wonder what I'd let myself in for, so I'd known uh, John Solston, who was our wonderful uh, director of the, the Sanger Center. Uh, previously, I'd worked in London with Peter Little, and I'd, I'd learned how to build maps from John and Alan Coulson's experience on building maps. And um, I collaborated with David Bentley, who is um, head of human genetics. So I, I knew David and John pretty well, um, but when I turned up and looked at the building, I really did wonder what I'd let myself in for. Um, and at the time, uh, it was an old building, the hall. So those of you who've been lucky enough to go to the Genome Campus will know Hingston Hall is there. That was looking a bit tired. The, um, uh, the conference center was actually a, a barn, a series of barns that were very dilapidated, but it was um, sort of an inauspicious, but wonderful start to uh, you know, my 10 years at the Sanger Institute as it is now or the Sanger Center back then. That's great. And so I've heard you say that when you got there, there was lots of stuff in boxes. There was no human genome project as we think of it. How did that transition go? So, yeah, so there was only one other person in, in uh, human genetics. Um, and there were two floors of uh, empty box. Well, they were full of empty labs, full boxes with equipment. And I was sort of trying to uh, envisage how everything was going to be used. But um, soon, uh, Alan, uh, Ian Dunham's group came up from guys, David came up from guys permanently, and we sort of expanded the mapping group that I was in charge of in the early days. And um, so it was an environment where we had uh, tons of resources. Uh, the boxes weren't just, you know, the only, the start and finish of it. We had very smart people joining the team who bought onto the idea that this uh, human genome thing may be maybe worth being involved with. Um, and so we had lots of opportunities. Um, the Wellcome Trust were fantastic at um, seeding the, the Sanger Center. And the opportunities allowed us to do things like develop mapping tools that uh, I did with Gareth Howell, who's now at the Jackson Labs in the US and with David. Um, and then we had access to sort of very early resources that allow us to map things. Um, Peter de Jong's uh, packed libraries and back libraries. So these sort of ways of breaking down the, uh, the genome or, or the uh, encyclopedia into manageable chunks. Um, and then we used some of those uh, resources with Richard Worcester and Mike Stratton to actually um, uh, find the BRCA2 gene. And Mike's now director of uh, the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute. So uh, it, it's sort of, uh, there's lots of threads that run through my time at the Sanger, which it just, um, very, very good memories of, of my time there. That's great. So you, let me follow up on the thread of, you were saying that you started packaging the genome into manageable chunks. And at some point there was, um, you decided to uh, kind of partition the chromosomes amongst different yeah. groups around the, around the globe. How did that work? Yeah, so that's, so if you think back to the analogy with the encyclopedia, it lends itself very readily to breaking up the genome into different books or, or different chromosomes, if you like. And so um, uh, each of the sort of large five centers around the world, so the Sanger Center was one, and then you had the uh, 
the Whitehead, which is now the Broad, uh, Baylor, Joint Genome Institutes, and, uh, oh, WashU, of course, um, were the big five. And so uh, for the Human Genome Project, we're allowed to divide up the, the genome um, based on you know, potential interest, um, experience in each of the different uh, research centers. And so the partitioning of the genome really built on the experience that uh, uh, John Salston and Alan Coulson developed with a very, very good collaborator and friend, uh, Bob Waterston at WashU. And so um, by having this sort of mapping first approach, we could break the genome up, genome up into manageable size pieces. And, you know, we all knew what our turf was. Uh, we're all looking over our shoulder a bit to see how everyone else was doing. But it was sort of, you know, competitive spirit. We all enjoyed, uh, you know, charging towards this fantastic goal. Um, but it all is all predicated on work that John uh, received his Nobel Prize for. Work that he did with uh, Bob was just fantastic. Yeah. And so uh, one of the... Um, how did you end up, didn't you end up really in chromosome one? How did that happen? Um, so Richard Wooster, who I'd collaborated with on, on um, BRCA2, he originally kicked off the chromosome one work, but then um, soon on after doing uh, mapping at the start, uh, found his passion for, for working on cancer um, again. So I took over chromosome one from, uh, from Richard and uh, then we, partitioned out the mapping into each of the chromosome groups and then the sequencing. So I got uh, a really good opportunity to work with uh, Kirsten McLean, and Karen Barlow um, as sort of uh, teammates in, in sequencing chromosome one. So the way that the chromosomes are broken up is that you have a, a mapping team, a sequencing team, and then also really important di uh, bioinformatics that Richard Durbin's group were leading at the time. And so we would have, you know, meetings around uh, the progress of the, the chromosomes. And um, so that's how I ended up in charge of chromosome one um, uh, for the Human Genome Project. And we were the last, very last chromosome to publish, as you know. Uh, uh, that's what I was going to ask you. Since I was the editor at Nature, how many times would you estimate that I called you and said, where's chromosome one? Yeah. Is it ready yet? Is it ready yet? It's like kids at the back of the car when you're going to a fun park. Are we there yet? <laughs> Um, yeah, it's, it's sort of funny because, you know, each of the chromosomes published in, you know, vast majority in nature and there, there are foundational uh, publications, but, you know, you can't rush science and you can't rush a good story. So um, it was, you know, really good uh, timing for us anyway to, to, it wasn't intentional to be the last and I did get a bit of flack for uh, being the last, but then, you know, it gets uh, tied up with a nice bow when we did. Absolutely. That's exactly right. So when did you, as you were there in the beginning and transitioning, when did you get the sense that this was really going to be a historic project being part of the human genome? Um, it's a good question. I think sometimes when you're so close to these things, you don't realize the importance of it. We all, we all knew it was really important. Um, but John, the, the way he directed the Sanger Center was just fantastic. It was a very flat structure. Um, he made everyone feel very included. Everyone regardless of whether you're a big cog or a small cog, we're all part of the same machine. So he did a fantastic job of, you know, just, just pulling everyone along with him. Um, you know, we had great uh, celebrations. I don't know how many t-shirts I've got in my cupboard with everyone's names on it when it was, you know, the Sanger Center was still pretty small. It was sort of like going to a concert, but, you know, paired with that, we worked really hard um, and, I think to me, it's not what we achieved on a day-to-day -day basis because sequencing is, is, you know, mapping and sequencing are just that. But it's when we have things like the chromosome workshops where um, the, the, the field would break up into these different workshops that we'd hold every year. And because the individual researchers had been looking at particular genes of their interest, they would look to see, you know, have we mapped, have we sequenced their, their region that they've spent a long time trying to uh, figure out. And I think having those workshops really brought home to me the sort of broader impact. I think you can release sequence to the public domain like John and um, those guys, John and Bob did for the worm, which is just foundational for science going forward. 
But I think when we finished chromosome one, we'd, I think we'd mapped something like 35 Mendelian disease genes directly. So that's, that's people that we'd collaborated with not necessarily just releasing the, the data to the public domain. Um, but that's sort of those sort of interactions really brought it home. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. I want to transition maybe now to Kirsten because you mentioned you had a ton of t-shirts and that's one of the things that Kirsten said to us. You want to? <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I said a while ago that um, I arrived at the Sanger in August 2000. And uh, at that time, the t-shirt with all the names of all the people who had um, participated in the human genome project that was then deemed sort of at this first milestone, um, that t-shirt had just been printed. So I missed out. Although I heard from other people who arrived earlier and got their name on, they felt really guilty about it for being on it without contributor. But anyway, I managed to get onto the big photograph um, yeah. that was taken for one of the, the articles, um, the way of all of the Sanger employees actually fit into a pretty small bit of lawn. Uh, we, we wouldn't fit there anymore. We, we were really not that many people at the time. So yeah, that was my first encounter with the human genome project because um, I had come from a background where I was into the genetics and genomics of bacteria and fun fungi. So human was a bit bigger. And uh, my first job at the Sanger Institute was uh, annotating all the genes in the human genome. Um, at the time, all these systems, they were just set up and they were actually two parallel streams. Um, one was the automated annotation of genes, which, uh, started working then and is still working now as uh, what you know as ensemble and so the other, give a little bit of background what when you say audit anim, automated excuse me annotation so basically you, you try to find all the genes in the genome assembly in the human genome assembly but you try to do that with computer algorithms so you throw the sequence in and then you trust that your algorithms will find everything that you need to mark out in this sequence as meaning because you've told the algorithm what a gene looks like exactly. right that yeah. is a it's quite a problem because yeah. uh, the signals for these things, they, they are not as universal as you might believe. So what this is usually done with is uh, with additional sequencing information that you get from the expression of those genes and you compare that to your assembly and then you can mark out what is where. Um, at the same time, we also have this manual annotation approach where we put all this data together into a browser and looked at it and then people, four people at the time, including me, went through and really marked out, ah, here starts the gene. There is the end of the first exon. Here's the next exon and so on. And that was, of course, a very laborious approach. So, so as a sort of a mark, we did chromosome 20 when I started, and it took us three months with four people. So you can sort of uh, calculate up how long the whole assembly would take. For comparison, the ensemble automated gene build can do the same in about a week now. Now it took longer then, but right. now they, they take about a week. But uh, the outcome of these things are different um, because if you do manual annotation, you put all this effort in, you of course get a much more refined product where you can add many, many more things where ever when you encounter problems, you can sort them through and, and really resolve them rather than just sort of brushing over and moving on to the next gene. Yeah, that's great. And so tell us a little bit about um, uh, how I know you then moved also from doing the human genome to other genomes, and in particular the zebrafish, which was a whole story. So tell us a little bit about that. So at the time, um, our um, PI, Tim Hubbard, uh, told us that um, two new projects were coming in. That was the mouse genome and the zebrafish genome. And uh, we threw coins and I won the zebrafish genome. So I then started looking at gene annotation in the zebrafish genome, and that sort of morphed into some other things because um, the zebrafish genome project was slowly starting and I was then invited to meetings and I explained to people how annotation works. And then I had to also explain to them how assembly works. And then I got more and more into assembly and sort of uh, the rest is exactly what I do now. So I, I went into programming and, and uh, creating and now evaluating assemblies. And, and this sort of, was born out of the fact that we all thought, oh, we've done human, we know how it works. We are mm. now doing mouse, we know how it works. Zebrafish will be a piece of cake. And it absolutely wasn't. Um, it was a thing where we really sort of ruined our teeth on. And uh, it took about a decade in order to get it into a somewhat decent shape. And um, size-wise, does it compare to human? Is it, was it the size or the complexity or? 
Well, fish are, um, well, some fish um, are just difficult. So at the same time, the, the puffer fish was sequenced and that was a really easy fish, tiny genome, hardly any repeats, easy. And people wondered why we were struggling so much with zebra fish, but zebra fish had a comparably large genome. Um, it was very, very repetitive. Um, and unfortunately we started off with sequence from very, very many different individual zebra fish. And what we didn't know at the time was that they were all so different. So the human genome, uh, there is not much variation between humans, actually. If, if you look at fish, it's, don't know, much, much higher. Um, and, and we really did not have any idea how that would affect the generation of the assembly. And we now know that it was not a good approach. So with mice, for instance, you used an inbred line. You could use as much material as you wanted because they were all genetically identical. With the fish, totally different story. <laughs> but uh, all these problems that we had with the zebra fish genome sort of uh, led to us developing processes that allowed us to evaluate assemblies and check where the errors were and how to correct them. And developing this whole process, actually we developed a browser which we called the punch list, which recorded everything so people could report into it the errors that they found. Um, and then we could report what we did about them and sort them and you could search this all. And then that was actually a great help for everyone involved because they knew whether they would expect a problem in a certain region and what was done about it, whether they should wait before they did something to it or whether they could already work on it, etc. So that was quite successful. And uh, in 2008 then, um, several institutes came together, so representative from several institutes. That was at the time the NCBI who sort of looked after the human genome at the time. Um, the Sanger Center, the EBI, uh, and also um, WashU in St. Louis, which is now the McDonald Genome Institute. And uh, they decided that someone needed to look after the human genome. Um, and that was sort of where we could then use everything we had learned from the Zebrafish project and put that onto the human genome and see where the problems still resided and what we could improve and had to improve. And um, so this was the Genome Reference Consortium that we founded in 2008. And it has been going ever since, correcting errors in the human genome assembly, uh, improving them, adding variation to it, and uh, making sure that everyone has access to it. Yeah, so what kind of errors are there still in the human genome? Oh, firstly, there are lots of gaps. Mm -hmm. um, you, you would be surprised at uh, how many gaps there still are, actually. Those gaps are very often in very complicated region, very repetitive region, that only recent sequencing technologies actually managed to get through. Um, then lots of problems arose from the fact that although um, the people who were sequenced, they were pretty much similar, they weren't that similar, so the algorithm sometimes got it wrong. And they thought that a certain region that was actually just from two different people was a duplicated region in the assembly. So instead of choosing the sequence from the one person or the other, choose both. Um, like, like that, you also get the other side of the medal. You get regions that were collapsed when they should have been there several times over. Um, very rarely we get things where um, the whole sequence is just scrambled and we have to reorder it but all sorts of things still remain. And um, recent development in technologies have enabled us to get into those really, really tricky bits. So you might have heard of the telomere to telomere project that has just successfully produced a whole human genome, really from one telomere to the other for all the different chromosomes. Uh, and it even went through all these tricky regions like centromeres. So um, this is something that uh, at the start of the Human Genome Project, I think no one ever intended to even tackle. And this can now be done. So technology has really come a long way. Yeah, that is that is amazing. And you set us up perfectly, I think, to transition to Jane to talk about changes in technology. But Jane, another thing I want you to address is, I think a lot of people may have the stereotype that scientists are alone and they're competing with each other. And I think all three of you are telling quite different story of working with the community and as part of a team. Absolutely. I mean, I come from a plant science background and biochemistry and was suddenly exposed to the human genome, which was this sort of big, sexy, amazing project. <laughs> and um, I didn't get t-shirts either because I started in 2002, wow. but we did have cake. I remember a mouse cake. Do you remember the mouse cake guys? Nice, you used to have cake and drinks. It was just 
amazing. And there were these big teams of people and everybody spoke to each other and everybody worked together. And it was absolutely fascinating. And I spent a lot of time also working on the zebrafish genome with Kirsten, which was quite interesting because it was incredibly difficult. And as a manual annotator, we were helping people to move on with the zebrafish genome. So we were looking at things and saying, well, we think this looks like it's actually a repeat and it's not a real gene and this kind of thing. Stuff that you can only do manually. So Kirsten's already said about Ensemble Gene Build, which runs an algorithm to create a gene set. You can get around 70-ish percent of genes like that, but this is a human genome, right? We need all the genes. Mm -hmm. So I started doing this in 2002 in team run by Jen Harrow. And I think Kirsten had just left. So I think there may have been six of us. We then soon ramped up to over 30 and developers and very good bioinformaticians to try and help us. The software that we were using had actually come from looking at the worm genome. So it was kind of repurposed. So we were using fairly clunky kind of development software, which all developed and changed as we went along. And obviously we had to work closely with people who were doing sequencing and mapping and assemb assembly and all these things as well, which was completely new for me, absolutely fascinating. And we learned so much. So a lot of this was trial and error. People didn't know everything because this was all really, really new. And as we said, we thought zebrafish should be super quick and it really wasn't. So that was quite shocking. And this whole collaboration with everybody. I mean, I collaborate with people all over the world. I have regular meetings weekly with our colleagues at NCBI in the US. And it's almost sometimes I feel like I'm working, you know, very close, they're my colleagues and we have calls all the time. I mean, current situation, everybody's having calls, but it's always been part of science. And I think particularly on the human genome, it's from a very small biochemical lab working on one enzyme involved in photosynthesis, which is pretty niche, to suddenly human. And it opens up this whole amazing collaboration that you have across the world to get the genome finished and get the genome in a, re a really good state so that it means that everybody can access it. And that's a really important thing actually that we haven't mentioned is that it's all freely available, which is fantastic. You've got all these amazing people doing incredible things and everybody has a part in this big jigsaw to create this, this fantastic resource. Yep, and to build on that, Kirsten uh, led us into technology. So what you're doing is, literally creating the browser or the framework by which everyone can see the genome and use it. I think uh, if anybody's listening is in genomics, we kind of take that for granted, but there's a lot of work that goes behind that. Absolutely. So there is a huge team of people. We have designers, uh, web technicians, web developers, you know, all sorts of people that work on all the nuts and bolts. So we have a very large database that runs underneath. We update every three months, which means we have to, we don't just have the human gene set. We have over 300 different organisms now in Ensemble. So we have a very large team of people that are very clever at putting these things together and updating and it all fits in a cycle where it all gets updated and added and released. And it's a very, very big machine. And in fact, we're now designing a whole new interface, which we were hoping would be ready this year, but because of various reasons and things, it is a little delayed. But it's very challenging to get this huge amount of data into a graphical format that makes sense. And we have lots of different users. So I came from a research background, a PhD in biochemistry, and I wanted to look at particular things on one enzyme. Other people are interested potentially from a clinical background or from different research or other research. So we have to try and be sort of a browser for everybody, but to make sure that we don't dilute really what we do. We display data, we add extra data, and we, make, we try and make it useful. And that's really the important thing, that it's easy to use and it's useful. And that kind of leads actually on to other things. One of the reasons that sort of um, cross paths with Simon and Kirsten is teaching people how to use the genome. So David Bentley, who's head of human genetics, when I came to Sanger, started up a series of workshops called the Open Door Workshops. Simon and I remember those early ones very fondly on campus. Uh, we also expanded these to do mouse and zebrafish. Kirsten and I have done many a zebrafish workshop and Simon and I have traveled to many fantastic places teaching people about the genome. And this is the other part of how it's freely available to everybody. We also want to teach people how to use it. And mm. we'll have a fantastic outreach team who continue this work now. And we are also involved in a smaller extent now do, doing workshops as well to explain to people how to use a browser, how to use the information that's coming off all these, all these sequencing projects, which is really, really important. 
Yeah, absolutely. That's a, a fundamental tenet of the human genome, right? As we've talked about. So we, I'm going to ask you one more question, and then we're going to um, start with some of the questions that we have in the box. Again, those who are watching, please, please put your questions in the Q&A box. And if you're a student and want to indicate that, we'll try to prioritize those. But Jane, when we talked earlier, one of the things you told me is um, you've learned for many years in working in genomics that you can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. So tell us a little bit about work. Yeah, work exactly. So there's been an explosion in sequencing methods. So when I was back in the lab, back in the day, back before probably lots of the audience were born back in the age of uh -huh. sequencing gels, I had to pour my own gels, oh, yeah. uh, ran them in a lab, and then we got automation and we got um, capillaries and all sorts of different things. And now we have actual single molecule sequence. I mean, it's just incredible. And because of this, we have a huge amount of data. So to put it this way, we did the whole of the human genome over all the years that we did, and the amount of data we have now, we were processed in six months and we did that in 10 years. So this is the kind of scale of things. So we have a challenge now of using all this new data, fantastic data, as Kirsten was saying, expression data. So this means we can actually know how much of a certain protein is produced and also which tissue it's in. And how do we display that? And how do we get through all of this? Because it's really, really complicated. So we're trying to find ways of displaying this information in a really useful way. We're also trying to update our annotation so that we can add extra information when we get it. But as I said, we're manual annotation. That means people actually physically look at individual bases of DNA on a screen with software. We have two or three monitors which go to the side because we have so much data. And guys in my team are looking at this stuff all the time. We're very good at looking at this stuff. But if you suddenly have, I don't know, 100 times the amount of data and you have to look through thousands of tracks, that's really, really tough. So we're trying to find ways of kind of semi-automating. So we can actually cluster things together and use computer algorithms and new technologies to actually sort of collapse down these things and find out the things which are really important and say, right, this looks new, have a quick look at this, what do you think? So we're actually developing software now to help us make quicker updates and add more information with the data. So that's the challenge we have now is there's lots of great data out there but filtering through that and finding stuff that's really important is really, really tough. Yep. Yeah, thank you. And that is a great transition. We wanted to come back to Simon and have him talk about what he's doing now, which is using the genomic data that he helped generate in um, actual translational work. Cool. So um, I've been at Duke for about 17 years. So uh, when I first came to Duke, we started working on, well, I started working on multiple sclerosis um, and then autism, and then I've picked up uh, several cancer projects during the, the during the, the 17 years that's flown by. Um, but we actually use the human genome sequence as the backbone for everything we do. So not only for you know looking at sequence variation that Kirsten said uh, exists in humans, and there's you know um, thinking back to what we thought was right and what was actual. Um, there's more variation than we sort of thought at a, an individual base pair level, you know, individual DNA nucleotide level. But it still provides a backbone on which we look for these mutational differences or the sequence variation. So variation that exists in the, um, the whole population. And we use these uh, frequencies of DNA difference at an individual nucleotide to look for a genetic association with a particular disease. So um, I used, uh, you know, the Human Genome Project and the sequence for looking uh, to identify uh, a gene associated with multiple sclerosis. I used the backbone for looking at copy number change uh, in relation to autism. And both of those projects have sort of um, started my own interest in those two diseases, but then also expanded enormously into, you know, lots of other different approaches that we're using to look in, in autism and multiple sclerosis. Um, and then in cancer, most recently, we're using sort of the, the foundational underpinning of the Human Genome Project to start carrying out these single cell analyses. So instead of looking in, in aggregate across millions of cells, we're drilling down to the individual cell. So the individual cell that has a mutation, that has a, an expression change, which predicates the development of cancer and things like this. So it's sort of my, my love of developing um, technologies that was fostered at the Sanger has been, you know, uh, allowed to flourish at Duke. And really the data that underpins all of this is the Human Genome Project and the sequence data that, you know, I helped 
you know, contribute a very small part of. Yeah, that's great. Okay, so we ha I have questions for all of you, but we have some questions coming in. So I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna let them ask the questions first. So the first question that we got from Joni is, who's a student, um, is the current knowledge and state of scientific progress on genes beneficial for the future of planet Earth as a whole? Oh, start off with a small question yeah. then. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good one. And, and Joni, I don't think specified if um, they meant human genes or not, but mm -hmm. so. You can say human, you can say zebrafish, you can say any genes you want in your answer. I say something to that. Yeah. So um, we are currently working on a project called the Darwin Tree of Life project, which um, Julian mentioned earlier. Um, the aim of the Darwin Tree of Life project is to sequence all living uh, organisms uh, in and around the British Isles. And this is part of a larger um, organization which is called the Earth Biogenome Project. So the Earth Biogenome Project really wants to sequence everything in this world. And with the data that we are getting from this, we, for the first time ever, get a full insight in what is possible, what is out there in nature. And this should have a huge impact on, it could have a huge impact on how we live our lives. Because not only will we then know what we might be able to do in terms of conservation for endangered species, for instance, but we will also know what is out there in terms of biotechnology. So for instance, is there anything that we can use for um, improving human health? Is there anything out there that we can use for nutrition? Is there anything out there that we can use in terms of fuel or destroying plastics or other pollution, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. So basically we get an overview of all of nature's possibilities and that is all in the genomes of all these species that we are now accumulating. I, I thought of it in, in a slightly different way too was that <clears throat> um, as, technolo as technology is advanced it's given us the opportunity to sequence you know there's not one human genome you know there's there's many thousands of different human genomes so um, different ethnicities uh, around the world um, and you know, there are reasons that we look different, respond to different foods, respond to different drugs, uh, have different disease susceptibilities. And so I always like to think that we're finally now, and you know, um, the, the very early human genomes that were generated were generated from Caucasians. And um, now it's, it's, it's amazing the, the variety of different genomes we have that represent uh, different ethnicities in different countries in different land masses and continents around the world which is really incredible so the um, human reference genome or grch38 or hg38 as some people might know it as um, is actually made up to 70 percent of a single individual and that individual is afro-american so it's not only caucasian um, but as Simon said, there are lots of um, other things that are going on at the moment. For instance, uh, the Human Pan Genome Project uh, has started. Um, and the Human Pan Genome Project will produce at least 350 super high quality genomes of both haplotypes of all these people from all different ethnicities. And um, that, for the first time, does not give us this one reference that we are attaching everything to, but it will allow us to use a whole graph, so a whole web of things, where we can arrange whatever we want to compare to this reference uh, and pin it down to whatever fits, not just desperately trying to squeeze it onto that one linear reference that we currently have. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The graph genome is where it's where it's at now. I mean, how we annotate that, we're not quite sure. So mm. this brings us back, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. We don't know how to do that yet, but we know we have to do it. So we will do that. And that's how it works. And that's what I've learned in working in genomics. We don't know all the answers yet, but we have a lot of really good people working on this and we will find a way to represent this in a way that works. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm going to chime in and add three things in answer. The first one is um, in this week's Nature that just came out yesterday, there is the H3 Africa paper, which um, was funded by NI, NHGRI, my institute, which looks at a number of African genomes. So I encourage you to look at that if you're interested in this question. There's also NHGRI had a strategic vision for the future of genomics. So please take a look at that if you're interested in this. Um, and then um, uh, the third point is exactly what you were just saying, Jane, about the, the different looking at annotation, et cetera. We just have to figure it out, right? We, we just have to go forward. And actually the thing that I thought when I saw that question is um, it, it, 
is genetics important? Basically, what are we learning about genes? I would point to COVID, right? We're, we're a number of us right now are attending at the same time as this uh, genome lates are attending the American Society of Human Genetics meeting, which brings together thousands of human geneticists from around the world. And they just had a late breaking session last night about COVID genomics, talking about both the human genome in response to COVID and then the actual COVID genome itself, the coronavirus genome itself. So yeah, absolutely genomics is playing a part in the things we do. So let me transition a second. So Emily, a student asked, what do you do in your day-to-day -day jobs? I already, let me say all of you, the answer is gonna be Zoom meetings. That's the number one answer. Because that's what we all do. But beyond Zoom meetings, what do you do day-to-day? -day? Okay, should I start? I spend a lot of time on Zoom meetings, obviously. Um, so what do I do day today? Okay, so this week I'm also attending the conference that Chris was talking about, ASHG. So I've been listening to other people do talks. Um, I often prepare other talks. I spent a lot of time, um, we have a workshop at this conference. So we have prepared a talk which we recorded for people to look at. I have team meetings with my team. I speak to them at least twice a week to make sure that they're getting on okay. We have different projects where we're looking at different types of genes. We, I have quite a lot of um, meetings to discuss how we move forward with lots of things. We have new technologies that are coming through. So every day I will have probably at least two hours, if not three or four hours of meetings to discuss how we progress with things. We then have team meetings and get people working on the actual things and then they report back. Mm -hmm. Um, usually I would be traveling around the world. I'd be in San Diego now meeting up with some of you guys, which is obviously really dreadful, but I hope we can do that again soon. So it's kind of a bit of a mix. There's depends what you're doing. So when I started off, I was doing lots of annotation and learning lots of things about the genes. And then now I'm sort of more applied. Um, but yes, it's different now because of the situation that we're in. But actually, I find, I mean, I'm sure Kirsten and Simon find this too, but there's also a lot of travel, and you too, Chris, there's a lot of travel involved oh. in because of this global nature. We do actually like to go around and speak to each other about things. I mean, it's nice to see everybody on a screen, but it's much better to be there. Yep. I fully agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Kirsten, Simon, what do you do? Um, for me, it's, it's like Jane says, you know, it's a lot of meetings. So let's pretend, I wish, that COVID hadn't happened. Uh, I'd be sitting in my office still having meetings. Um, I have a group of 12 people sort of roughly split between lab folks um, and people who do analysis. Um, I have um, usually I would have had a high school student. So I started a program with the high school across the road where um, both my daughters, Olivia and Isabella went or Isabella's still there. So uh, the high school students would come over for a period a day. So I'd be talking to them. Uh, I have grad students who come from Duke who work in my lab. And I also have grad, uh, sorry, undergrad students from Duke and also grad students at Duke. So there's a fair bit of mentoring on all that. Um, there's meetings with um, my guys in the lab to see how things are going. There's meetings with my collaborators because, you know, I, I mentioned briefly that I work on autism and, and um, uh, multiple sclerosis, but there's also probably half a dozen cancers and Alzheimer's and all this sort of stuff. So there's a lot of collaborative meeting and um, they're really, really interesting um, because the science is going in so many different directions that sometimes it's a matter of figuring out, you know, okay, meeting finished, right, what's the next disease? Where were we with, uh, you know, progress with that disease? Yeah. So on a day-to-day -day basis, I lead a team um, that tries to make assemblies better. So we get assemblies that were produced by algorithms, and that can be of any species out there. So we've seen a lot of vertebrate assemblies, insect assemblies, plant assemblies. Um, now we start to see mollusks and fish and uh, other things. And um, they come out of an um, automated pipeline where algorithms put lots of different data types together and create the best assembly possible. But unfortunately, all these things, they don't quite work flawlessly. So we still find lots and lots of errors in them. And because we try to make all these assemblies as good as possible, and especially we try to get the structure right so that people can say that this really is a chromosome and this is really all of that chromosome in, in the right order so that they can then, for instance, do evolutionary study and see how chromosomes evolved in different species. For this, we really need to get it right. And on a daily basis, we do this. We have four people in the team who do this manually. So uh, they don't go and annotate genes um, like in uh, Jane's group. 
But what we actually do is we go through assemblies and we try to divvy out what belongs where and where we can maybe else put it and how we connect it all, etc. Um, we have people who develop browsers in order to allow the people who do the manual uh, curation to see all the data types at the same time and see how they can solve problems. Um, but quite a large amount of work is spent on trying out new data types and trying out how we can improve our processes, um, sort of elevate them to the next steps because all the time new things are coming along. So that also requires talking to lots of people who have developed new approaches, uh, who are producing new data types. So we are not just talking to people who develop algorithms, but also to people who um, develop and sell sequencing technologies. And uh, they are quite interested in what we are doing because we give them feedback on their work. So we can influence quite a lot of these algorithms and improve them over time. And um, it's, it's basically, uh, well, someone once said that um, they feel like they, they, they are doing daily Sudokus. It's all sort of <laughs> problem and resolution. But um, if you need a certain personality type for this, well, it's very rewarding. So it, it's really nice to solve problem after problem and do that together in a big team where everyone ships in. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, so I have two questions which are pretty similar here. The first one from Arena is, do the panel members have a favorite gene they have personally sequenced or annotated? And then Jennifer asks, what is your favorite human gene and why? Hi, Tim. Oh, I, 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 I knew someone was going to say that. <laughs> I annotated the Titan genes. It has oh my about, gosh. don't know, just under 400 exons. So it's one of the longest genes in the human genome. And it took me an awful long time, but I did it. <laughs> wow. So this is, a, that's a humble brag. That's a hashtag humble brag is what I'm yeah, I was gonna say. It certainly is, Kirsten. So for me, so I was involved a lot with chromosome nine and PTPRD, I can't remember what it, but that's a symbol for it. That was a really big gene and I can remember doing that. And the thing about chromosome nine is it has, it had a very large, what's called a pericentromeric region. So this means it's near the centromere and centromeres are very, very repetitive. And they were really, it was a really difficult thing to do. And I can't remember his name, Sean. I can't remember his name. He was, oh, yeah. uh -huh. remember, oh my goodness. He used to phone me up all the time going, uh, have you looked at this? He'd like to say a clone name and go, right, have you finished doing all the genes on this? And I go, I don't, and the clone names are really, really long. And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. And I'd be looking stuff up really, really frantic on chromosome nine. But I definitely remember to PTPRD because it was really, really long and it had massive introns. So cool. introns are the bits. So you have an intron exon structure on a gene. And what happens is, as it goes through the enzyme, it, it skips along. So all the bits of DNA in between don't get included in coding for the protein. And I just remember it had very big introns and it's quite a big gene, but it's nowhere big as Titan, Kirsten wins on size. So <laughs> It's not all about size. So yeah. um, it's, it's not, I, I didn't just throw that in for Hammerbrack. I also wanted to add that um, I sometimes now use Titan in vertebrate genomes in order to assess how well assembled they are. Yeah. Because if I find the Titan gene and if I find all of it, it's like, yeah, okay. Great, that's right, great um, point. I think for me, you know, I, I had to annotate chromosome one for part of my PhD at the Sanger. Um, and I, I was using um, an example of a gene duplication the other day with a colleague um, in um, Oregon. But I think, I think my favorite would have to be BRCA2, I think. Um, I can remember David Bentley calling in, me into his office still when we're in the old building. And I was just about, I'd just gotten married to my wife, Deb. Uh, we were about to fly out to Australia to go on our honeymoon. And he let me know that uh, we'd actually found the gene, um, which was you know, an intense, um, uh, tensely com competitive, um, but it was a fantastic feeling to, to, to be part of the team that actually found it. So it was a, a publication that came out uh, in 1995, which, you know, was 20, 20 years ago and, and my anniversary coming up. Um, so I'll always have, you know, and Deb reminded me the other day, I mentioned BRCA2 in my wedding speech before I actually mentioned her. So. <laughs> she was delighted, Simon, poor Deb. <laughs> she's, she's very understanding, <laughs> very, very tolerant that this is uh, what I do, but probably BRCA2, I think. And, and not only just for me personally, but because of the impact that it has on, um, you know, screening is, uh, so uh, BRCA1 and BRCA2 are uh, a gene, are susceptibility genes for uh, heritable breast cancer. 
and it had a hell of an impact uh, in the, the field of um, not only breast cancer research as in what's the gene, what does it do, but just for screening of, of women and, and men who um, uh, can suffer breast cancer, but screening for those, those patients, but also their families. It has, it's just, you know, has significant impact. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to come back to the name in a second, but my favorite gene is FMR1 because that's what I did my PhD work on. Mm -hmm. It's on the X chromosome. And it was fascinating because in the course of one PhD, we went from just finding the gene right before I joined the lab that caused this um, cause of what we then called mental retardation, now called intellectual disability. Um, and then we went from that all the way through the biochemistry and we're into neuroscience by the time I completed my wow. PhD. So science can move really, really quickly. But right. we have another question, which is let's talk about how genes are named. So Simon was just talking about, he was saying BRCA, which is BRCA, one and two. So how are genes named and why are they funny? And then tell us your best funny name oh i don't know if i can say so. <laughs> i think the best name, names come out of um uh like the drosophila gene yeah names. they have great names don't they're they? the best gene names absolutely out of the 70s and lots of things were legal in the 70s but i think that influenced a lot of the gene names i have sonic yeah. hedgehog and stuff that they say sonic hedgehog that's what i was gonna say the first time yeah. that my advisor told me about that i was like i think he's totally wrong that's a video game oh my gosh you got it totally wrong but no that's actually the name right. of the gene for human genes, we have the HNC, which is the Hugo Genome yeah. Activity. And for mouse, we have MGI, which is Mouse Genome Informatics. And what they do is they actually name the genes. So we have a really close relationship with this team, which is led by Oscar Bruford. And what we do is we do the annotation and often well-known genes will have a name. People will use a name in the literature. It's like we talk about, you know, this is my favorite gene, you know, what sort of Jane's gene. And then the problem <laughs> Jane's gene is someone I might find another gene and think oh I want to call that one Jane's gene I don't want to call this one Jane's gene and then you might have a look in zebrafish and think oh that's got the same gene I'm going to call that Jane's gene as well and then it all sort of becomes crazy and then someone says well actually no I thought that was a different gene down here so mm. we have to make sure that gene names are descriptive mm. and are um everybody agrees on using that same term okay which sounds really really simple so but the thing is, genomes aren't neat and tidy, okay? So you don't just have one copy of a gene in a person. You can have several copies. You also have what are called expansions and deletions within people. So some people may not have a certain copy of a gene. And the reference genome, as we know, is more than one person. So then you get into these problems where you think, okay, but this is where the GRC comes in and a lot of these things. So in some cases, we may have what's called a, a different copy of a different piece of genome, which means that that gene is slightly different. So we have to give that a different name and these are called patches and these are sort of bits to try and fix the genome. So it's a lot more complicated than you think. So we have nomenclature committees that do this for us because they consult with teams of experts to make sure that we're calling them the right things. So often they will be initials, which actually stand for something. So um, I can't remember what half of them, you kind of just end up kind of making words out of the initials anyway. You know, Sonic Hedgehog is great because that's software, but I'm trying, I mean, there's, I don't know if I can say, there's one called the ARSE gene, the ARS gene, which <laughs> We annotated that recently. I put it out there. I've studied it now, which kind of always makes slightly laugh. If we make something that seems faintly a little bit cheeky, it always sort of, <laughs> we actually do message each other in the team. Um, we have a, a, a little messaging thing and people say, oh, I'm looking at this gene today. And like, ha ha, kind of, it's a bit of a informatics. So this thing. was all over the news um, a couple of months ago because um, the Human Genome Nomenclature Committee um, yeah. Released uh, the, um, um, a manuscript or a paper that described their recent genome changes, and they oh, um, sort of corrected those root names to something better. And, and what really struck me was they also corrected all the names that otherwise get translated by Excel into dates. So oh, yeah. they don't have March yeah. twenty gene anymore because that yeah. just created problems for everyone who works with Excel. It's uh, funny that you need to sort of take heed of things like this, but yes, mm -hmm. you do. Excel. No, that's exactly right. Yeah, no, that's a great point. That was in the news. So let me take us to a different question, which David is asking us, please, please, please take a step back. If I understand correctly, a gene is too small to be viewed in an optical microscope. How can you begin to see or envisage and then analyze a gene and then determine what the differences are between different genes? I think the thing to, to think about is that quite often what we're seeing isn't what we're assaying. 
um, what we invariably see is a surrogate. So if you're thinking you're looking at a protein, we will have an antibody which labels a protein, but the antibody is actually fluorescently tagged. So you look under a fluorescent microscope and you can't see the protein itself, but you can see the antibody which is attached to the protein, which is fluorescently tagged. So we can see where the protein is. Sequence is obviously a lot smaller because we're looking at individual nucleotides. And so when we sequence through a genome or a chromosome, we just have effectively four different colors we look at in these sequencing machines. So A, C's, G's, and T's are the four nucleotides that make up our genomes. And if I took a chunk of, uh, I used to give a talk to a lay audience where I would have three and a half thousand of these A, C's, G's, and T's and say to them, all right, show me where the gene is. And it's just gobbledygook. You can't tell um, where a gene starts or where it finishes. But a gene is actually sort of a certain uh, combination of these nucleotides. And Jane and uh, Kirsten spend a long time aligning um, the coding part of the genome to our, our genome. So the RNA, we align to the DNA. And the RNA are the things that make the proteins. So, you know, central dogma, we go from DNA to RNA to proteins. But by overlaying the proteins on top of, uh, sorry, overlaying the RNA on top of the DNA, you can see in that, that, that gobbledygook of sequence where the gene actually starts and finishes where the exons are and the introns that Jane just talked about. So it's not seeing a gene, um, it's sort of picturing it in this context of these four bases over you know, 2.83 billion of them across our genomes. And when we look for something that may be associated with a disease, we look for an individual change, like a nucleotide difference between um, a disease population or non-disease or in a, um, a Mendelian or uh, inherited disease, we look for a mutation that runs in a family. And so we look for these changes. So that's why the Human Genome Project is so important because we establish the baseline, but then we look for differences to this baseline that tells us where in the gene, um, you know, the mutation or the, the DNA variant may lay. Yep, absolutely. And so we have a question, which is, I think, a little related to that, which is the other side of the coin. So this is politically charged. So I'm just going to tell you that up front. Azeem has joined us from India to say, do we understand what junk DNA is and what is its function? Uh, I'm stepping back. Y'all, go ahead. <laughs> I don't think any of it's junk. Yeah, so I think yeah. That's, great. yeah that's, that's a very difficult term. We just don't know what it does. So there's been a lot of chat about this that, you know, the actual coding genome part, which is protein coding genes is a really small percentage. I think it's under 5%. So everyone says, well, the rest is junk. That's definitely not true. We don't know a lot of what it does. This is what we talk about with all the new data types. So we know that we have genes that code for proteins. We have things called pseudogenes, which are genes which are likely inactivated. We used to think they were definitely inactivated. Now we're not so sure. And we have things called long non-coding RNAs. So these are things that don't code for proteins, but they have intron exon structure. And we know that their position is unique in the genome. So these, there's all the bits in between. So what do they do? So we know that a lot of these bits in between are actually regulating the gene oh. expression. So they're switching things on and they're switching things off. So when we talk about the number of protein coding genes in the human genome, we initially thought there were sort of over 100,000 and then it got less and less. And we're now sort of 19 and a bit thousand, so under 20,000. And for something as complicated as a human, it seems a really small number. And the reason that there are fewer is we have these things called alternative splicing. So a gene doesn't have just one, what we call a transcript. So we have a gene model. It has lots and lots of different ones. And when we look, at all this new data, we can have things that have hundreds of different versions of that one protein. So one gene doesn't just express one protein, it can express different proteins in a different tissue or in a different life yeah. stage, all these kinds of things come into play. And that's the same with the bits in between, just they are there for a reason. And also what's very interesting is sometimes these bits in between are conserved in other species and that's when you know that they're doing something so that's a really good indicator so we use zebrafish human and mouse together even in evolutionary terms they're very distant 
So it means that if we have something that's conserved between all three of those, and we often throw chicken in there as well, because that's a bird yeah. and that's quite interesting in evolutionary terms, and we find something conserved, we know that that's likely to be doing something because it's been kept through evolutionary time, okay? So we have indicators that these other bits and pieces are likely doing something, but we don't really know what yet. So I think we don't tend to use that term junk DNA now, do we? No. So it's just the, the bits that we don't know about yet. That's right. And I yeah. think the, the thing about the human genome is, is it's not linear. You know, you look in the textbooks and you see you know, metaphase chromosome arrested, you know, chromatids and, you know, your typical chromosome structure. Um, but it has secondary and tertiary structure. And that means that it has big loops. And so something that may be very, very, very far apart um, are actually quite close together because they're looped around. And uh, as Jane said, that you have these evolutionarily conserved regions, which can be really important for making a gene express itself, but it may be miles away. And so that's why there's still so much to try and understand about this, these in, in, intra and intergenic regions that we think or thought of originally is not doing anything. Yeah, absolutely. It's amazing. Nuclear packing. I love that. That's my yeah. that's niche yep. hobby. Exactly. So uh, we have lots of biology questions, but I want to make sure we get this question from a student. So what is the most surprising challenges? What are the most surprising challenges you've faced in your careers? Ooh. Um. My current most challenging bit is that we have an influx of an incredible amount of high quality genomes and we have to evaluate them all and correct them all into even better quality. And we have to do this without uh, making more mistakes because we want to remove all mistakes and we have to do that in a timely manner. So the amount of work is currently our real challenge. So we have established procedures, but getting this all done in uh, due time is tough. Mm. So I work mainly on human, but also mouse, and we'll be doing a few of the other species that Kirsten talks of. So having these thousands and thousands of extra species is a challenge. But what for me, I suppose is quite surprising, we're not finished on human yet. And one of the reasons we're not finished on human yet is we don't know all the bits in between, but so it's kind of like two parts. We're not finished on human yet. We've got a really, really good human sequence now. And we've learned an awful lot doing it, but we're not finished yet. So that's really interesting. So when I first started this job nearly 20 years ago, I'm still working. We still have lots and lots to do. So that is fascinating. And then also, as Kirsten says, we've got all the, we've got to update it. So not only are we trying to make our gene set super good, we're trying to make it super accurate and, and relevant with all the new tech. So it's kind of a little bit Kirsten's balls. I think for me, it's probably, um, well, I can remember going back to Australia and giving a, a talk um, at, at the high school that I, I graduated from. And one of the students said, well, now you've finished the human genome project. Now, is there going to be anything left to do? And uh, which made me chuckle a little bit because my frustration is we will carry out an experiment and we still don't know why we're seeing genes in cells or tissues or why we're seeing how these genes actually relate together in pathways. We, we know absolutely so very little about how the, the human body works or even biology works that I suppose my uh, abiding frustration, well, I suppose I wouldn't have a job if we knew everything, um, is trying to piece, but it, it's, sort of, it's, it's sort of an interesting puzzle and it's a challenge. You find something new and you're trying to fit uh, uh, differentially expressed gene or pathway into a disease phenotype. So how do what we find in the lab today influence the disease that's already developed? And then how can we use the pathway that's been activated perhaps as a potential druggable target? So it's, there's so much left to know. It's, it's really amazing. So we, we talked about sort of the, the first finished version of finished version of the human genome being this huge milestone that we're celebrating now. But I think we are currently making history again and facing another milestone. And that is the imminent release of the first fully finished human genome, where we actually now know what is in all those gaps that we had no idea of earlier on. And I, I find it really exciting to learn what all these newly added sequences will reveal. Um, 
also um, by creating this human pun genome now for many, many individuals, we will now have a chance to learn what really is the difference between people. So for many years, uh, sort of people who investigated differences in different uh, human individuals looked at um, single base per variants, so just the one base per and checked whether changing one base per made a difference to how a person sort of turns out in terms of health or development or something else. But now we really can look at what structural, bigger structural differences are in humans. These, this was all attempted early on, of course, and this has been studied in detail, but now we will have totally different possibilities of looking at this all in parallel and comparing this and also checking what, what effect that has on the individual. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's how I would answer the question as well is it seems to me in my career in human genetics, it feels like every time we answer a question, it just generates 50 more questions, right? Just like Kirsten was saying, we can now look at stuff that we didn't even know in the past to look for these big structural variants. And then we didn't know how to look for them. And now we are able to, and that opens a whole box of new questions. So absolutely. And along those lines, Gerda asked, what skills do you think are essential to work with genetics and what ways of expanding your knowledge would you recommend after getting a degree in genetics? So Gerda, I would say uh, working with other people in a team, which seems easy, but is not always easy. That is definitely a skill. So I would recommend communications. I'm biased because I like communication, but I, I would definitely learn how to work in a team because you will be. Yeah. And also, so I'm biology, but I work I mean, I'm a, I could think of myself as an applied biologist, but I work with a lot of bioinformaticians and developers, which is a very different skill set. So I think learning to, as you say, Chris, learning to communicate and also learning to communicate with people in different disciplines is really important. Um, so I know little, I mean, I have done previously little bits of coding and stuff like that. So I know tiny bits, but people like, you know, Kirsten's really good at stuff like that. I will let the people that are good at that do that but make sure you're open to learning little bits to kind of work out how they think, because this kind of field needs people that understand the biology, but also understand the technical stuff. So you can actually do the developer work, the coding work, sort of bits of Python and R and stuff. Kirsten will know more about this than I do. So I, I think two qualities that uh, are, are really essential are curiosity and being proactive. Um, I think curiosity is it's very important in all fields of science, because if you come across something weird, you don't just want to brush over it and move on. You want to find out why it is weird, because only that way you will find out new things and you will find out the reasons for why is this this and not that. But uh, also, um, if, if you want to pick up uh, a job in this area, I think you need to be very proactive because no one will really tell you what to do. You need to find what you do and you need to be able to drive yourself in um, achieving good results and uh, getting on with things because um, research is something that you need to pace yourself. Um, there will be no one standing next to you saying you need to have these results by next Saturday because that's not how it works. You need to keep at it and try to improve it and sort of shine a light into all the, the little bits of it in order to bring this to a good result. I was just trying to find my, my, one of my favorite sayings by Louis Pasteur, chance favors the prepared mind and opportunity favors the bold. So I think if you're able to move forward with those sort of um, uh, tenants into, into your career, I, I think it'd be really helpful. For me, you know, as Jane said, collaborative science is the way to go. I deal with um, uh, clinicians who are seeing patients. I deal with specialists who have had years of training to become fantastic doctors. I deal with statisticians. I deal with bioinformaticians. And so being able to be a common thread between those fields are really important, but that comes from knowing your science um, and being able to communicate what it is that you're doing. Absolutely. All right, wow, we have so many more questions that unfortunately we can't get to. Um, thank you so much for being with us. I think this is great. I know uh, the people, the questions that we couldn't get to, I know that I am on Twitter, so you can ask me questions. I don't, or any of you on Twitter, Simon, I can, you are, right? Yeah. No. Yep. So do you wanna tell people your Twitter handles? I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Simon, my, my email address is online, so they can definitely email me. Find Simon through email. Thank you. <laughs> Just from our institute websites. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. So you can send yeah. us emails afterwards. Yeah. Um, thank you again, and I'm gonna turn things back over to Julian.
Thank you very much, um, Chris and Simon and Jane and Kirsten. I, I mean, that was just absolutely a joy to listen to. Fascinating to hear your memories and reflections. I mean, we, we say often how rapidly the field is changing, but it really is just changing at a phenomenal rate. Mm -hmm. And to hear from some of the people who were, have witnessed that change firsthand through their careers was just a real privilege. So thank you very much to all of you for being so open and honest and discursive. Um, I, I also, you know, was interested in, to note in the discussion about skills and what's important in your jobs, you highlighted communication and I, I could not agree more. Um, first of all, just to say, I think you all exemplify, you know, excellence in science communication in, in the way that you're able to communicate what you do and, and why it's interesting, but also that it's such an important part of what we all do in our jobs. And it's not necessarily what people think, you know, you don't necessarily, you, there's this sort of vision of a scientist as a lone person working at a bench and that's just not true. It's about communication and teamwork and listening. Um, and yes, I think you all show that incredibly well. So thank you. The one other thing that struck me as uh, while working is, while listening, sorry, was, you know, hearing stories about what the campus looked like um, when the Human Genome Project started and I, I joined um, the campus only 12 years ago. So in fact, the original building when the Human Genome Project was started in was gone by the time I arrived. But Simon, I don't know how recently you were here, but some, some years ago, we actually mapped out the footprint of that because I sort of vaguely knew where it was on the campus, but you could never quite place it. And so now there's a memorial to mark, you know, where it was and you can sort of see the building in in 3 days it's it's oh, wow. still there. that's really cool i'd i'd love to come back and so i'd come back and have a meeting and catch up with people i can remember when lightning hit the tree that is now a sculpture between the ebi building and the, the sanger building so yeah i love coming back so it's it, it's, a, it's an extraordinary place to work um because you feel that it's somewhere that history was made and i think you've oh, all talked about that history and yep. it brings me to my final point. So for those of you who are listening, you know, uh, many of you will not have had the chance to visit the, the campus, but I would just highlight that um, we have an annual, we, we have a regular open um, session, open day, when anyone can come and visit the campus uh, in person um, called the Open Saturdays. Um, because of, as everyone talked about this evening, the current situation, obviously we can't do that in person, but in fact, what it's made us do is turn that experience virtual. So if you look for the Welcome Genome Campus Public Engagement website, you can find the Open Saturdays and you will have an opportunity to tour the campus virtually and see some of the buildings and some of the, the spots and the places that um, were mentioned this evening and also talk to some of the scientists who are working here currently. So please do check out Open Saturdays, Welcome Genome Campus Public Engagement and sign up for one of those virtual tours and also when things return a bit more to normal, please also join us in person. Um, then finally, this is not the, the final um, Genome Lakes seminar. There's another one happening next month on um, just November the 26th. At the end of this, we'll put up a slide, I believe, um, with the details about how to register that. For the last several months, large numbers of the genomes are going through the sequences on the campus all the time. For the last several months, many of those genomes have been COVID-19 genomes. And the, the story of how those samples make their way to the campus and are processed and, and tagged is just extraordinary. So we will be um, hearing from a couple of people involved in that um, effort on um, November, um, the, November the 26th, Thursday, the November 26th. So again, Search online for Welcome Genome Campus Public Engagement, Connecting Science, and you'll be able to find it. That's all I had to say. Thank you again to the amazing panel. You did an incredible job. Again, if you if you had questions that you wouldn't and they were not able to answer them, please email us and we'll um, send you an answer by email. Thanks again and have a wonderful evening, everyone.